Welcome to Green Gotham. I'm Lou Blaustein, and thank you for joining us. Thank you also to Green Gotham viewer Alana Revord from Geneva, Switzerland. That's a long way away. Thank you for sharing your great work fighting climate change on behalf of the World Wildlife Fund on our Facebook page. Also doing great work fighting climate change is the Citizens Climate Lobby a group of citizen lobbyists who are advocating for a price on carbon via a legislative proposal called Carbon Fee and Dividend. And this promises to really thread the needle between giving us a real serious action on climate change while garnering Republican support, which heretofore has been very difficult to come by. So, Joining us to talk about carbon fee and dividend and much more is Joe Robertson, Global Strategy Director for Citizens Climate Lobby. Joe, thanks for joining us on Green Gotham. Thanks for having me here, Lou. And there's a lot to talk about, mm -hmm. and, but first and most obvious is why don't you take our viewers through what carbon fee and dividend really is? Sure. So. Carbon fee and dividend is a way to put a price on the emission of uh, greenhouse gases. And the reason you want to do that is because the, this process of emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is causing harm, which adds cost, which is hidden. So you have this failure of the market to tell the truth about cost. So when carbon, you say, t talk yeah. a little bit about the costs that are hidden. You're talking about externalities sure. right. from the burning of fossil fuels. Right, so when you burn X amount of fossil fuels, oil, coal, gas, um, you put this stuff into the atmosphere. One of the externalities is just pollution. So, you know, people end up with lung disease or something like that, smog in cities. Um, another externality is the fallout from changing climate. And that happens because these compounds heat up the atmosphere and the oceans and it causes the way energy moves around the planet to change. So you get droughts where there shouldn't be droughts. Um, you get astonishing situations like in the Pacific Northwest where it's currently possible to say the rainforest is on fire. Um, those are externalities. They have real costs. Um, but they're not priced in. No one in. is paying them. That's right. No one's paying them. Society so. is paying them through pain and suffering, but yeah. no one's paying them in terms of financially or economically, you know, in terms of well, buying gas or goods. Right. You don't pay them when you buy the actual fuel uh, retail, but you do end up paying them through health costs, right. through uh, your government budget spending on responses to disasters or dealing with floods or droughts or those kind of things, um, or even just different kinds of hardship that emerge from the, the external costs. So the idea is that the costs are socialized. Everybody's yes. paying them, but there is no price that you pay to buy. There's no price on carbon, and that is seen mm -hmm. as by people who talk seriously about climate change mm -hmm. as the a. I was going to say the holy grail, but at least a holy grail of getting action done on climate change. You have to put a cr price on carbon, yeah. but so far. It hasn't been able to get done in the United States, so carbon fee and dividend is possibly a way to do that. When you look back historically, the, the use of fossil fuels is a very expensive, very complicated proposition, and so it has always been subsidized. There's always been a lot of help for that industry. And there is a time when that was, you know, the only way we could really do things at an industrial scale, and we didn't realize how much harm it was going to cause and how much cost there would be. Now, when you talk about wanting to make sure we pay that honest cost, you have all of these businesses that the whole economy depends on that are not designed to work with that new higher cost that always should have been paid from the beginning. And so when you talk about putting a price on 
fuels, you need to figure out how can you do that without disrupting the economy. So that's how the carbon fee and dividend plan was designed. The idea is that you put a fee on carbon-based fuels at the source, the mine, the well, or the port of entry to the United States. It starts low, $15 per ton of CO2 or equivalent greenhouse gas emissions. CO2 being carbon dioxide. Yes, so sorry. It's, so you're paying, the, the fee gets put on the fuel at the beginning of the process. Yeah. When it's mined, when it's when it's when it comes up from a well yeah. or if it comes into this country. And there are a few really good reasons why you want to do that. So that's the place where this problem enters the economy. So if somebody wants to do business with that material, this policy says you can go and do that, but you need to pay a fee for that. Uh, for the right to do business in that way. Um, and so that fee starts low initially, but you put it at the source so that you have the simplest administrative burden. You don't need regulations. You don't need to track all of the end use emissions. You don't need to look at the billions of, of points of emissions across the U.S. economy every year. You just need to deal with the few thousand entities that actually introduce fossil fuels. So they're the only people who pay that fee. And then what happens is the cost will start to ripple through the economy. And so in order to deal with that, we take 100% of the money that they have paid and return it to every American household. So the producers pay, mm -hmm. and then eventually the consumers pay with higher prices at, for fuel or for other goods mm -hmm. that, that carbon is embedded in that they right. buy. But they're getting a dividend from, that, from the, produce, the producers paying in. Yeah. And so how does that dividend appear, like I'm a household, how does mm -hmm. it appear in my checkbook or do I get a check in the mail or how does that work? Yeah, so again, we want the most administratively simple thing. So that is you get a check or direct deposit, every household gets one, you get the exact same amount as everybody else, up to two adults and up to two half shares for children and you get it every single month. And there's no variation based on income. It's a flat. There's no variation based on income. And again, this was designed to be as simple, transparent, and comprehensive as possible. So you have the fee at the source, and all the way at the other end of the economy, you have the dividend going to everyone. So now, in between, everyone can hash out how you deal with rising costs, because those costs were always there before. They just weren't visible. So now they're becoming visible, and you start to make choices. What do I want to do with that dividend check that I got last month? I've got a couple hundred extra bucks this month. I could spend it on more gasoline, which is getting increasingly expensive. I could spend it on something that's going to provide me with a way to save energy. Um, and little by little, I can learn how to save money without being burdened by the cost of this industry. And so it is going to, in theory, mm -hmm. change behavior among consumers. Well, it to, to lead them to a lower carbon lifestyle. It should, but it doesn't do it because consumers get punished. So a lot of people's thinking about how to do this kind of thing is you raise the cost of doing something so high that anyone who would want to do it is essentially going to suffer economic consequences. And the problem with carbon-based energy is if you do that, you affect the price of everything. It's not like cigarettes or alcohol. It's You're affecting everything. Right, the there's price no of clothing, the price of milk. And so by giving the revenues to households in that monthly dividend check or direct deposit, what that does is it says you can consume the way you need to consume, the way it's available to you in your neighborhood. You don't have to withdraw from the economy. You don't have to make uncomfortable choices about you know, food or medicine or anything like that. The people in the economy who can't afford to deal with that kind of burden don't have to. But the way that behavior starts to change is services begin to become available that save you energy and that eliminate carbon from the economy. So you get a carbon efficiency incentive for everybody everywhere because businesses and investors want to get rid of that cost. And so in your neighborhood, you might choose proactively to go out and change your behavior and consume less carbon. Or you might wait until people bring that option to you. Right, where you might have the same quality of whatever you were buying before, but just right. a lower carbon version of it. And so since a lot of people don't have time to learn all they need to know to exert that kind of leverage, um, and a lot of people don't have the 
the economic wherewithal in their surroundings to actually exert that kind of leverage. For people who can't, we can still marshal their economic activity to make change because anybody who wants to get those dividend dollars back, any business, is going to have to try to compete to be more carbon efficient. And as the fee starts to rise over time. I was going to ask that. It yeah. rises. So what's the increase? mechanism. So the, the idea is, again, administrative simplicity. It starts at $15 per ton of CO2 or equivalent emissions, carbon dioxide or equivalent, and it goes up by $10 per ton per year. And so the idea is you just set it on a course where it's going to keep rising. And what that does is it gives everybody clarity. Businesses know, here's what I need to plan, not just today and tomorrow, but 10 years from now. I can start thinking, how much added cost can I get rid of if I start innovating and doing something more carbon efficient. The consumer, the viewer out there may not understand what that sure. means. What do, is there a way to translate that into, say, price of gas at the pump mm -hmm. or some other thing that is easily digestible? Yeah, $15 per metric ton of carbon dioxide emissions is roughly equivalent to 13 to 13 and a half cents per gallon uh, of gasoline. And so, so it's almost a one-to-one, -one, like 15 almost to into, into cents, yeah. Right. But the thing is that what people don't realize about the changing price of gasoline is that that is not enough to cause you to not be able to live your life and drive around. What it does is it adds to the industry's costs in a way where they need to start shifting. But for a comparison, when George W. Bush took office in 2001, the price of gasoline was under $1 nationally. When he left office, it was almost $4. And we did not have a significant slowdown in people driving around. So to the average consumer, that added cost is completely palatable. And since they have the dividend, they can actually deal with it. What it does is, if you imagine the worst case scenario doing it this way, charge a fee at the source, give all the money back to consumers, the consumers just give it all right back to the carbon fuel pro producers. Well, that would be the worst case, but when you start with a low fee and it rises over time, in that worst case- At a case, steady increment. At a steady increment, the profits stay the same, but the profits are a smaller and smaller share of the overall amount of money moving through that business model. And that means that within five to 10 years, investors really need to start moving into something else or they're gonna see a decline in their, in their return on investment. Actually, that makes sense, which is scaring me, but it makes sense. <laughs> so now, is this, does this system exist anywhere in the world? Has it been tried? And mm -hmm. what have the results been if, if it has been tried? So um, there are different models of carbon pricing that do give revenues back to people in different ways. Um, in California, their emissions trading system returns some of the revenues back to households every, I think it's six months, through their electricity bill. So they don't get a cash payment, they get a credit, uh, a reduction Similar. in their bill. Um, but they can see it and they can understand it's there and they know that's money that I have that I didn't have before. Um, in British Columbia, in, in Western Canada, um, they instituted a revenue neutral carbon tax, which means they put the price on and they give everything back. But their way of making it revenue neutral, giving all the money back to the economy, is to reduce taxes. And so instead of giving everybody a check or a direct deposit, they reduce this tax over here, that tax over there, this other one over there. And there are a lot of ways in which that's similar. But there are some important ways in, in which it's different too. And but ha how has it worked in, mm -hmm. in, in in BC? Is it being judged a success? Yeah, it's been tremendously successful. So Canada, just like the rest of the world, experienced some economic hardship a few years back. Um, we know the Great Recession hit here pretty hard in the United States. British Columbia was beginning to implement this carbon tax at the time that was going on. And what they saw in contrast to the rest of Canada, which went into the Great Recession, was they never went into recession. And in fact, they had new investment, they had new jobs, they had a transition economy. And compared to what was going on all around them, that policy actually created a very clear economic incentive to do new things, invest in communities, build things and change the economy for the better. 
And if I understand carbon fee and dividend here, the, mm -hmm. the proposal that Citizens Climate Lobby is trying to advance, that is actually being touted as a job producer as well. Yeah, we, we, um, we're very fortunate that we have all of these incredible volunteers who put in a lot of time and a lot of intellectual muscle and who really dedicate themselves to working on this project. And some of them got together and sponsored a study by a, an economic modeling firm called REMI, Regional Economic Models, Inc. And REMI is completely nonpartisan, non-ideological. All they do is deal with numbers. And their preferred way of dealing with numbers is to look at economic history. So instead of theoretical models, they like to look at what actually happened in the past when prices changed by this much, and how did all these different sectors of the economy change. And so what Remy did was they modeled this, this plan across 160 sectors of the U.S. economy and nine regions. And they got all this specific information and they made it all interact. So you don't just see, well, this, the price of this changes. They look at how do people respond to that price change and how does that response influence another industry. And with all of those interactions, they did a 20-year-long projection. And what they found was that after the first 10 years, we'd have 2.1 million new jobs. And after the first 20 years, there'd be a total of 2.8 million new jobs, most of which are not green jobs. Those things would happen partly because of this and partly from other things. Green but jobs me meaning jobs in, say, the renewable energy right. industry or in energy efficiency or yeah. industries that support those, just to make it clear. No, yeah, exactly. And so a lot of, a lot of times when, when we talk about what kind of transition do we get from a good carbon price or from climate action or from clean energy, we're thinking about how many people can work in wind or solar. And it's a, it's a lot. But what Remy found was that the bulk of the overall hiring wasn't that. That was a portion of it. But the, the, the places where you saw the most hiring were just ordinary Main Street everyday jobs. And the reason is because when people have a little extra income every single month, what they do is they bring it into their local community. They go get one more dinner with their family. And that gooses they, the economy. Yeah, and there's a, there's a very particular benefit to having that money moving through the local Main Street economy, which is, you know, if I spend a dollar in a cafe and then someone gets it back as change the next day and that same person goes there as often as I go there, they spend it again. And what you can actually see with that kind of local activity is how many dollars that one dollar turns into over the course of a year. It's a much more direct way to create incentives that grow the middle class and that make the Main Street economy robust and, and resilient. Well, so it sounds like a, sim a simple plan, mm -hmm. and it sounds like a plan that has economic benefit, and it sounds like a plan that's going to get us off of carbon gradually over time. Right. So, okay, let's sell it. So that's what CCL and the lobbyists do. So talk a little bit about how the lobbying works, sure. meaning lobbying members of Congress, both senators and their staff, and House of Representatives in Washington, um, at least on an annual basis. So, well, we do go to Washington, D.C. for our annual conference once a year, and that has grown dramatically. Which was in June. It was just, yeah, just uh, last month. And um, this year we had 900 people from all over the United States come. And so people are actually going to meet with their own elected officials. Um, this has grown dramatically since 2010. In 2010, we had 25 people. This year, we had 900 people. And you almost, I think you met with almost every member of Congress, both House and, and Senate, mm -hmm. and or their staff, yeah. which is, from what I understand of citizen lobby groups, to do that over, I think it was a two-day period, mm -hmm. is astounding. Yeah, it is. It is so inspiring to see, and people get very emotional when they realize how big this team is that they're part of. Um, and so, but the citizen lobbying itself, it's different from, you know, the kind of lobbying we've all heard about in a lot of ways. It's not K Street, it's not fancy dinners, it's not going to the, yeah, to yeah. the Nationals game in exactly. the luxury box. It's, exactly. It's not that kind of treatment of the people in Congress, and it doesn't involve money and it doesn't involve threats and it doesn't involve promises of some sort of benefit to anyone. All that these people are doing is going to talk to their own elected officials and say, listen, you know, you represent me. 
you swore an oath to represent me. And the fact that those people are there means they don't even have to say that. When, when elected officials meet with their own constituents who are genuinely, honestly being respectful, constructive, interested, supportive, trying to help them do better in their job, they understand that's what that oath was all about and they want to do a good job. So what we do is we ask our volunteers to work together, be prepared, know the history of the people you're going to sit down with. Don't go in accusing them of something that's not true, saying they don't support something they do or vice versa. And I saw the system and it is so detailed and these people are so prepared. It's so impressive. And my question is, you know, kind of taking a step back, mm -hmm. you know, and knowing the politics of Washington and of the country, you know, taking a 30,000 foot view, Democrats largely would be Democratic representatives and senators would largely be sympathetic to something like this. And Republicans heretofore have not been. But it sounds like this proposal is talking Republican language. And is that, and how is that going? Well, so there's no shortcut, right? Um, I think one of the things that makes doing something constructive in Washington difficult is that at some level, everybody secretly wants to just push the button that will get their thing to happen. And they're looking for that, that trick or that special moment or that Ma particular magic. rhetoric that has magical powers. But it doesn't really work like that. These are real human beings. Everything has to be done through conversation. There has to be mutual understanding. You need coalitions. So our volunteers, they're prepared not to go in and try to sway someone or manipulate the conversation or drive the conversation. They're prepared so that they are in a better position to show respect and admiration and gratitude to the people who serve them and to build real working relationships with those people. So that the person on the other side of the desk knows you've come here because you actually respect that I'm here to do something for you. You're trusting that I have some judgment and you're honoring our democratic process by doing your role as a citizen, which is to come in here and help me because I may have judgment, but I don't know everything. And so that creates a much more honest environment. There's three legs to the Republican stool in my way of looking at things, right? There's the people who are concerned about taxes being low and don't want more government. Then there's the national security folks, mm -hmm. and then there are the social conservatives. And it seems to me that carbon fee and dividend is hitting on all three of those. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. So I think that's fair to say. You know, that's what we do is we sit down and try to spend time listening to what people's values are. And so they're telling us we want fiscal responsibility, we want the nation to be secure, we want the economy to be competitive. Um, and there's the social conservative position, which sometimes is about smaller government, about individual moral uh, attitudes driving people's choices. Um, and it does touch on all of these things, but I think that the important detail is that partly because you have personal connections between governing officials and the people they represent, and partly because the proposal itself doesn't do the wrong thing on any of those fronts. You get to remove people's fears and get them focusing on, well, how do I actually express my values now? And this is what we've started to see in the last couple of years, and especially this year more than ever, is that there are people who are in that group where they're conservative, they're, they, they know what their party's position is and they share virtually everything about it, but their values drive them to think, how could we do this? How could we do something that protects the vulnerable, right? That's a, that's a moral principle that most conservatives think is worth thinking about. Um, how can we do something that makes sure we don't have out of control national security threats? The Pentagon says that climate change is the single biggest threat to global peace and security in this century. Huge threat multiplier. Yeah. And so, and then how can we do something that meets the sort of fiscal responsibility standard, the economic conservative standard, the pro-business Main Street economy standard. And here's a proposal that can actually accomplish all of these things while making sure that the American people are in the driver's seat. And then the Pope comes in and comes out with his encyclical. So that talks about the moral side of this 
three-legged stool. Mm -hmm. And so as we're kind of running low on time, yeah. by kind of making this work in Republican language, do is there any risk to losing Democrats? Well, so I think on the on the Pope's encyclical and the moral message, there is the the caution that again, there's no shortcut. It doesn't automatically happen that everybody changes their mind because somebody with a similar view on certain things has a view that we like. But what what Pope Francis did that's so impressive, I think, in that document was he included, you know, his predecessors, he included the tradition, he included all of these different elements of human activity. And he didn't just talk about climate, and he didn't just talk about carbon emissions. He talked about the ways in which our behavior as individuals in society and as societies more largely actually degrade our humanity and degrade our ability to live our own spiritual values. And so I think that's where there's so many points of entry into that narrative, and we have such a responsibility that's where I think you really start to bring everything together, is when people realize the logic of what I'm doing says we need to be responsible individuals. Having a solution that can allow you to do that becomes a lot more attractive once you've made that particular connection. Well, this sounds like the best way that I've heard to advance this in a tangible way legislatively. Mm -hmm. How do the viewers out there, if they want to join Citizens Climate Lobby, how do they do it? Um, they go directly to citizensclimatelobby.org and there's a button there, join, and you'll be able to sign up. And our volunteers have um, always active, free access to training and education on all levels. Couldn't be easier. Yeah. And I think that Green Gotham viewers are going to be joining Citizens Climate Lobby. I, I hope, hope so. you do out there. Joe, thank you so much for coming on and talking about this incredible possibility of a price on carbon. And thank you out there for watching. Please join Citizens Climate Lobby and please join us next time on Green Gotham.